Hi chemists, welcome back. In this unit, we are going to explore something called chemical bonding. This PowerPoint is going to teach you all about the basics of chemical bonding. After this video, you will be able to explain how ionic and covalent bonding occurs, write Lewis dot diagrams for elements in the S and P blocks, and determine the number of valent electrons for a particular atom. There are two major types of bonding that we will discuss in this class. The first one is ionic bonding. Ionic bonding involves a transfer of electrons. One element will lose electrons and the other one will gain those electrons. The second type is covalent bonding. In covalent bonding, this involves a sharing of electrons. Atoms will share in order to reach a stable electron configuration. As you might expect, this will be divided up into two different lessons. We'll spend time talking about both ionic bonding and covalent bonding. One thing that's really important to note is the octet rule. The octet rule says that atoms will gain or lose enough electrons to become isoelectronic with a noble gas. The word isoelectronic just means to have the same number of electrons as a noble gas. You may ask why is this important? Well, noble gases have a very stable arrangement of electrons. And so by stable, I mean it's just resistant to change. That's why compounds form, because we want to increase the stability or resistance to change. One thing that's important to do is to remember how to write electron configurations for ions. So for example, if you were to write the electron configuration for magnesium with a two plus, you would have to indicate that two electrons were lost, and when that happens, it has the same electron configuration as neon. We would say that is then isoelectronic with neon. For the phosphide ion, P with a three minus charge, the electron configuration would look something like this, and it would be isoelectronic with argon, or have the same electron configuration as argon. Last but not least, we have the bromide ion, that would be the configuration for the bromide ion, and it would be isoelectronic with krypton. As you can imagine, the valence electrons are extremely important, and so we use something called electron dot structures, which are also called Lewis dot diagrams, to indicate the way the valence electrons are arranged. Electron dot diagrams are a way to show the number of valence electrons that an atom has. These are, again, very important because these are the ones that are going to participate in bonding. Valence electrons should be labeled similar to this. For example, if X represents any element symbol from the periodic table, you want to place one electron on every single side before you double up and give any side two. The number of valence electrons can be determined very easily by looking at the group that the elements are in. Fortunately, we will only be working with the elements in the S and the P blocks. For example, here is a table that will help organize you. For group 1, the valence electrons are 1. For group 2, the valence electrons are 2. In group 13, notice we skip over the entire D block. Those are 3. In group 14, 4, I think you see the pattern now. The electron dot structure needs to show the number of those valence electrons. So for example, lithium would only have one dot. Beryllium would have two. Notice that those two dots are not placed together. They're placed on separate sides of the atom symbol. That's boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. As you might expect, these element symbols should never have more than eight dots around them. As I mentioned before, valence electrons are the electrons that participate in bonding. So elements in the same group behave the same because they have the same number of valence electrons. 
That makes it really easy to predict how many electrons are going to be lost or gained to become isoelectronic with a noble gas. So for example, the elements in group one would lose one electron. The elements in group two would lose two. The elements in group 13 would lose three. Group 14 is a little tough because they're actually right smack dab in the middle of the periodic table. And so they can lose or gain four. Group 15 will gain three. Group 16 will gain two. Group 17 will gain one. And I have a smiley face for group 18 because they're already satisfied because they have a full valence shell. When group one loses one electron, it'll be a plus one charge. When it loses, when group two loses two, it'll be a plus two charge. Group 13 will be plus three. Again, since group 14 can lose or gain, it'll be plus or minus four. Group 15 will be minus three, 16 will be minus two, and 17 will be minus one. And again, group 18 is satisfied, so we won't see any loss or gain of electrons. It's important to talk about some of the properties with ionic bonding. So for example, ionic bonds will form between attractions between positive and negative ions. I know I just spoke about how we'll see that one atom will lose electrons and the other atom will gain it. And when that happens, you've now created positive and negative ions. And you know that both positive and negative attract. And so that is the ionic bond. An ionic compound is also made up of crystals. Crystals consist of a 3D repeating pattern of alternating positive and negative ions. The formula unit is the lowest whole number ratio of ions on the crystal. Ionic compounds have high melting points and boiling points, and they conduct electricity when melted or dissolved. For example, if you look at sodium chloride, this is the crystal lattice of sodium chloride. You could probably guess that the green is supposed to represent the chloride ion, because you know that anions are larger than the neutral atom from which they are made. And then the sodium ion should be the lighter blue color. The formula unit corresponds to the actual structure. So for example, the formula unit, since it's a one-to-one -one ratio of one sodium ion to one chloride ion, we would expect this to be the formula unit on the structure. I hope that helped you to understand some of the differences between ionic and covalent bonding. This was an introduction. You can definitely expect to go into a lot more greater detail later on. Thank you so much for watching, chemists.